Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Course of World History. I am your host, Mr. Samuelson, and today we are looking at imperialism on our unit on imperialism. So today is going to be focused on what it is that we're really talking about during this time period. So our essential question here is, what were the goals of Western imperialism during the late 1800s? And we're really drifting into the early 1900s as well. All right, imperialism and empire. The Industrial Revolution, which we've been talking about um, leading up to this lesson, gave a real significant economic and military advantage to the nations of Northwest Europe and to North America. Here we're really talking about Britain, France, Germany, Netherlands, and a few others, um, and the United States of America. Now, these industrial nations could produce more wealth and then use that wealth to project their power outward. And in the mid-1900s, all the way up to World War I, 1914, these were the peak years of those countries projecting this forward, uh, projecting this power outside of their boundaries and um, kind of trying to take over the world. So who are the competing powers? Well, they were the industrialized nations, and here they are competing for more and more global territory. The main competitors when we talk about this time period um, are European, and they include Britain, France, and Germany, uh, with really Britain number one, France number two, and Germany a somewhat distant number three. Um, but there were other imperial, imperial powers as well. Uh, that did include the United States, notably, um, but also Portugal, Spain, Italy, Japan, Belgium are all snapping up territories around the world as well. Now, all those nations, with the pseudo exception of Japan, um, would be considered Western versus non-Western. So let's talk about those terms because we're going to use them a lot. Uh, during this period, the term Western really evolves to mean industrialized nations with a history and culture tied to Western Europe. Um, now, this is kind of a funny, not entirely accurate, but accurate-ish look at what is Western. Um, we have the Westest here in the United States, Le West, uh, Europe, and then some other areas like South Africa, which has a lot of European culture, Israel, which has been, you know, a lot of European culture mixed in there, Australia. And then we get Japan over here, which is like honorary Western. Definitely Asian, but with a lot of Western culture and a lot of Western influence, quick to embrace that. And so honorary Western. Now, keep in mind, this is not the most accurate way to look at it. Um, and certainly through here, I think they're poking fun at, uh, you know, racists, really. Uh, but um, it just kind of gives you an image of what is considered to be the West. Now, Westerners um, do see themselves as superior uh, to non-Westerners. There is more than a smidge of racism thrown into the mix of what imperialism is all about. And that was really highlighted for everybody um, by the poet Rudyard Kipling, um, who refers to imperialism as the white man's burden. That is, the white man is responsible for bringing civilization and industry to the rest of the world. He is arguing that since white people are the best, they've got to go out and show everybody else how to do it, right? Totally racist. Um, there's no basis to believe that, but Western nations did have the economies and the militaries to go out and kind of try to fulfill that goal. So what are the targets of imperialism during this time? Uh, the prime targets of imperial policy are really Asia and Africa, with an extra emphasis on Africa, um, but also Southeast Asia, clearly, as well. Uh, Europeans had long sought to dominate these regions, but not to control them. There's a difference here about being the one who's kind of recognized as being more powerful, and you've got to listen to me because I'm more powerful than you, and really totally controlling. Um, this shift comes during this time. Now, why are we not going to talk about the Americas and Australia? Well, it's because their native populations were largely wiped out because of the Colombian exchange. Native Americans died out from smallpox. The same thing happens to the Arab... Uh, I'm totally blanking on 
the aboriginals, gosh, the aboriginals of um, Australia uh, get largely wiped out by European diseases. So those places take on a European culture and feel when Europeans show up. Not so in Africa and Asia. They were largely not immune, but resistant to these diseases um, and didn't have their cultures devastated by them. So these were existing strong cultures that were not going to fall over at a small push. All right. So new imperialism. Um, this is a move from just controlling the na- uh, just dominating the nation to having a long, uh, large land-based empire that really controls it. Um, here we kind of see imperialism in Africa before this thing really kickstarts. Here we have the Ottoman Empire and it's controlling some stuff. And there's certainly the Cape Colony, which is controlled, but mostly we're looking at little ports, port areas that are being controlled by Europeans. Now, if we go back to that last slide, this is where we're going to be by 1913, with the only independent places being Ethiopia and Liberia, and everything else has been totally captured, dominated by European powers. Um, So that is where we're heading. Now, this new new imperialism does begin uh, around 1880, um, and Western powers move from just controlling those port cities to overthrowing governments, expanding their control over the people, the land, and really governing um, directly or indirectly uh, throughout the entire nation. Wow, some benefits. It's not all negative. Um, We are going to talk a lot about the negatives of this, but it is not all negatives. Um, Obvious drawbacks, warfare, fighting, death, uh, extinction of cultures, denial of self-rule. These are all strongly negative things. But new new imperialism did have some benefits. Um, The spread of schools. Now, that was not done out of the goodness of people's hearts. That was done to teach Western culture and try to change the minds of the people to have less resistance in the future. So these schools were not set up to be benevolent um, organizations. We want you to learn to read. We want you to learn to write. We want you to learn to... That's not what this was about. This was about shaping the culture of the nation. But what it left behind was a legacy of schooling. And nations that hadn't had formal uh, education now had it after imperialism, but partly due to that legacy. Other examples are better roads, better railroads, um, better commercial ties to the rest of the world, and the abolition of some inhumane practices. I know in a previous lesson we had once talked about um, how in the Mughal Empire they had dealt with this problem, this Hindu problem of uh, burning widows at the uh, hu- at their husband's funeral, that being a traditional custom practice. Um, the Mughal Empire has tried to step in and outlaw that practice. The British came in and really did put the final nail in that practice. So those were some of the benefits. It's not all negative, but we will be talking about a good deal of the negatives. But that is all for today. I do hope you learned something and enjoyed this lesson, and I'll see you next time. Farewell.